have brought you to this event. Um, this is uh, an event sponsored by the English department um, to offer alumni perspectives on a degree in English. And I assume that some of you are English concentrators or thinking of an English concentration. So I'd like to just to begin with a few words about um, what it means to be a concentrator in English from my perspective. Um, I was true confessions. <laughs> Uh, a double concentrator at Brown in English and classics. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I love Latin literature, and I still love Latin literature. Um, but I chose to continue um, teaching um, uh, because uh, um, I liked Latin literature. I didn't like classics professors very much. I <laughs> preferred English professors, so I stuck with that, um, that mode of inquiry. Um, but I, I'm married to an English major, and I'm the son of two English majors, and god damn it, my children, you know, majored in comp lit and, um, and MCM, which are just all the same thing as being an English major in, in many ways, um, very admirable things um, um, to do. And I, I, I just want to, before I introduce our panelists, just to sort of to reflect on that kind of um, posterior relation that any kind of thinking about what you want to do has to do with um, what you will do, because you never know what you will do, right? You will do what happens. <laughs> um, but you still have to make decisions about what you will do. And I, I'm, I'm remembering one moment um, when I was, I think I was a junior at Brown, and the Blue Room, um, which was what we called the snack bar at Brown, um, you know, which is now this grand place that occupies the center of Fonts House. But the Blue Room was a, um, was a small um, room uh, that's now, if I think about it, trying to locate it in the past. The old Blue Room was um, uh, just above the entryway to Fonts House. So if you you couldn't get there from the Fonts House Arch, but if you came up the stairs nearest to Fonts House Arch, you would turn um, right and you'd go into something that looked like a snack bar um, from a, a sitcom, you know, um, about the 60s. And um, I was in the line one day in that snack bar. It had stools, you know, the stools that spin, spin with leather and covers, um, and it had a form like a um, counter, and behind it were various coffee urns and those magical um, um, levers that delivered Coke or ginger ale. You know, it was, it was like definitely a 50s nostalgia piece. But I was walking through um, that line, along the line of stools, um, and I was with um, the woman I was dating, out dating term, right? Um, who's now my wife of a very long time. Um, and I encountered my um, Greek professor, um, uh, Bruce Donovan, who's, who died last year. Um, and um, I introduced him to Mary Jo, my wife, then my girlfriend. Um, um, and I, I said, um, 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 Mr. Donovan, we didn't call professors professor then, we called him Mr. Um, uh, or there weren't very many misses, and that's why we changed. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I said, Mr. Donovan, um, this is uh, Mary Jo Risher. She's a sophomore. And he said, in his perfectly absurd way, I was a sophomore once, <laughs> so was my wife. Because he, too, had married a woman from what was then called Pembroke <laughs> College. <laughs> But I, I tell this ridiculous story um, because it's it's about the relation of uh, the past to the present. We were all sophomores once, right? <laughs> um, and we may now be juniors or 60. I'm 60. Isn't that awful? <laughs> uh, um, uh, but our present has some relation to where we came from and to where we want to go. Um, and we have to choose. Um, sometimes where we want to go before we know what we want. Um, and that's what we're really talking about today. So we've invited um, three people who very 
um, generously um, agreed to come to us who are alumni of the English department. Um, alumni is a word that is common to all of us in um, the academy, although we don't know what it means. Tell me what an alumnus is, or the difference between an alumnus and an alumnae, or how to pronounce alumnae, alumna, or alumnae. We're, we're not too far from alumnae hall, right? <laughs> but an, an alumnus is someone who has been nursed, right? Um, someone who has been nourished, someone who has been fed. Uh, and, and when we talk about um, uh, the mater alumni of, of college, um, uh, we're talking not about our natural mother, um, but about our nursing mother, about someone who we've chosen to, um, to listen to. Um, um, so we go from something that's outside of our control, um, something that's a matter of nature, to some part of our natural life that is to some degree within our control. And that's what we're really talking about um, uh, um, today, our relation to um, people who we've chosen to be our mothers in some, um, in some way. And we have um, three mothers <laughs> um, with, us, um, with us today. And to my immediate um, left, is someone who I actually know, <laughs> Alice uh, Ra, um, who was my student in um, uh, a survey course, or no, freshman, a, freshman seminar, seminar <laughs> at Brown, and who I kept in touch with through her years at Brown. Um, and she now works for um, a publisher, W.W. W. Norton, in New York. Um, and um, next to her is Jay um, Candelmo, who has done two of these events for us in the past. Um, he's a repeat offender. <laughs> um, and he's gone from English to a, a career in um, finance. Is that a fair way of saying it, Jay? Yep. Um, and um, you told me this morning you were in my class at some point. And I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, at, the, at the end of the table um, to my car um, left is Sarah Iran. Um, who uh, uh, is um, a recidivist. She's um, come back to, um, to the prison from which she was once released, um, and she's an English <laughs> professor. So what we're do our format today is really very simple. We're inviting um, these three friends to um, come back to their nursing mother and to talk to you, who are still people um, who are nursing in some um, extent, to some extent, and to talk about what you do with a degree in English. And it's a very current um, problem because um, to ourselves and to our culture, um, we have to define what it is to mean to, to be an English concentrator. It's not just a joke like Jack Garrison Tyler makes it. It's a real choice, it's a, and it's a happy choice. Um, um, and that's what we want to hear about. <laughs> so I don't have a format, um, but I will ask for volunteers. Would someone like to start and talk about just what's informally about what's happened um, in 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 life um, between um, graduating from Brown and discovering what you can do with a degree in English? Okay. Yeah. Happy <laughs> to go first. Um, Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. And I, I think it's good that um, you know the university has events like this. I think English isn't the only department that does this, but it's a good opportunity for students to think about if they choose a concentration, what, what might they do with it. Um, there wasn't anything like this when I was a student here in the 90s, but I think it, it's a good opportunity to have this sort of discussion, and I'm really uh, happy to be here. Um, so I graduated 14 years ago. And when I was a student here, um, like Professor Foley, I, I did a dual concentration. I did literature and also anthropology. Um, I had always loved English, you know, as a, a kid growing up. That was always my favorite class in, in school at all levels. And so there was never any doubt that I would continue to study in that field. It was something that I enjoyed, a subject that I thought was beautiful. I was, you know, thought I was a good writer, and so that just made sense to continue with that. 
I had sort of stumbled into anthropology. Um, I was going to take a, a bio course my second semester, and I remember thinking, oh, I just don't want to do that. Like, and so um, at the time, the course catalog was still a book. So looking through the course catalog at my parents' house and thinking, OK, I'm not going to take bio 20. What am I going to take? And I found this anthropology course, and I didn't really know anything about the field, but it was about cultural anthropology. And so it was quite interesting. And um, by studying the two fields, you know, I was able to um, examine from different sides the interplay between culture and language, which I thought was interesting. Obviously, writers have some influence on culture and are in turn influenced by what's happening. And so I, I thought, I, I studied the two subjects because they just appealed to me and they were beautiful and I felt they had intrinsic value. Yeah, and I saw a way that they related uh, to each other. Um, but uh, as far as what came next, um, I also was, was viewing my time here in somewhat instrumental terms. I was telling the other panelists before we came up here, um, it was a huge opportunity for me to come to Brown. My mom and dad hadn't gone to college. They sacrificed a lot so that I could get in here. We took out a bunch of financial aid. And so as much as I was committed to getting a liberal arts education and on studying fields that I just thought had beauty and that would help me as a person. I was also very much interested in, okay, what can I do when I get out to make sure that I can pay off these loans and, and sort of get a return, as it were, on the fact that I've been able to take a step forward in, in my life. So um, when I was a student here, the web was just sort of taking off. I was here in the, in the late 90s. Um, I taught myself how to design websites really as a hobby because I wanted to create an online tour of campus because I was a tour guide at the admission office. I uh, one of my volunteer roles uh, in the Bruin Club. And so uh, I learned how to do that and just ended up doing about a dozen different websites, um, including for the admission office my senior year, like the official side, not just the tour, the president's office, and was able to parlay that to a job at IBM, um, doing the same thing but getting paid to do it. Uh, and so I did that for a few years. Uh, went back to school full time to get an MBA at the Sloan School, and have worked in my current field in financial is that, services. Is that at MIT? MIT, yeah, yeah the Sloan School, MIT. Um, in my current field for the last nine years, uh, where I'm, you know, at a Fortune 500 company as a vice president at that company, we manage retirement plans for schools, hospitals, companies like 401k plans and stuff like that. So that that's been the path that I've taken. Um, I would study this field again a hundred times. Uh, I just, I keep saying this word, it was just beautiful. It appealed to me. And b beyond me thinking of in instrumental terms about some hobby that I can parlay into a job, um, also I, I certainly think that being able to communicate effectively and succinctly, while English is not the only field that helps hone those skills, certainly um, helps you with that in a very direct way. And that's been effective when I worked at IBM as a consultant working with companies that hired us to do their websites. It's been effective in, in my you know, field for the last decade or so uh, to be able to communicate with clients, with colleagues, with people that you lead if you're in a management role. The, the discipline that studying English gives you to be able to communicate effectively, I think, has served me you know, well throughout my career. Thank you, Jay. That, that's Jay Candelmo. You were class of 99. Um, so that, that's really great. So let's just get a, a brief overview from, from everybody. Alice, would you like to go? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this I got is Alice Raw, sorry. <laughs> um, so I graduated in 09. I studied English and I was also a double concentrator and I did AMSIV as well, which was actually my more, um, my parents did not approve of AMSIV. They thought English was okay though. Um, so. I Because they didn't know what Sim was? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was writing papers about the Spice Girls, so <laughs> they did not think it was the best use of my time, which it was. I loved it. Um, but I love reading, and I love stories, and I love <coughs> studying literature from various ages. Um, so I did that, and I thought I got such a great foundation here, and I wanted to continue um, working with books when I graduated. So I didn't really know how to go about doing that. I ended up um, in sort of one of those 11th hour career services visits, um, finding out about the Columbia Publishing course. Um, so that was actually my 
weigh in. Um, that, um, for some of you who are curious about this world, I'm happy to talk about it in either a Q&A or afterwards. Um, but it's sort of this like six week residential course all about publishing. So you hear from professionals from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and do these workshops. And from that experience, I really learned that I did want to go into publishing. I really did want to make that um, my career. So I <laughs> graduated from that, guns blazing, and had sort of this dark time where I was unemployed. Um, I became a paralegal for a short month, um, and it was this time where I had sort of resigned to being a lawyer eventually, going to law school. Um, but you know, before that, I had been interviewing at all of these publishing houses, and a month into my job as a paralegal, the director of publicity at Norton gave me a call, and she said that I'd interviewed with an editor there, and he had just been so impressed with me because we had had this very long conversation about Calvino, which the English department here had introduced me to. Um, and he just thought I was fantastic and that I should be in publishing and that I would be great for publicity. So I ended up um, going in and interviewing and getting the job, and I've been there for about three years since. So that's sort of um, where I am today. I started as a publicity assistant, and I have worked my way up to publicist. So it's been very gratifying. I went from working on these thinky um, paperbacks to sort of thinky hardcovers, and then to hardcovers with a little bit of name recognition. So um, it has been a lot of fun, and I would really encourage people to go into publishing um, if you're interested in, you know, staying with your sort of English roots and working with books and working with literature um, and working with authors. Um, but you know, making a career of it. So I'm happy to talk about basically any aspect of that with you guys. Sarah, you're, I, I said you were a recidivist. I, I think you're an assistant professor waiting for a life sentence. This is maybe <laughs> a more accurate <laughs> metaphor. <laughs> but this is Sarah um, Iran, um, who is teaching um, English at uh, URI. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Colleen. I, um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I really enjoyed the eloquent introduction around words. I think that's what brings people to English departments. Uh, but it's not just the aesthetic pleasure of reading. I think there's something about being an English concentrator that helps us to understand where we come from in the world, right? That literature has been connected to culture for all these times, to the classics, to philosophy, and um, it's, when I teach, I feel as though I am helping my students to think about how we are in the world and how we've been in the world for centuries. And what is it that's at the root of our human nature? And that can be a very exciting thing for students, um, but it's a daunting thing for the parents I speak to when their students go into English majors and what can we do with an English major. Um, I think that Professor Bully is very correct in, the, in, this, econ in this economy, right? Uh, whatever profession you go into is going to be a, a difficult route and many undergraduates come out of college floundering and panicked. Um, with all of this knowledge and excitement and not really know, knowing where they want to go in the world and um, that's normal. Uh, and so, but I think that there is a way in which sometimes our career paths choose us. Um, for me, that was an emotional choice. Um, I, I knew actually when I was very young that I, I mean in a, in a strange way that I wanted to go to college, uh, I was, you know, the first woman in, in my family to get a PhD and on um, the other side to get any kind of higher education. So I knew that I wanted to go to college. I knew that I wanted to read for the rest of my life and probably teach and become a professor. Um, but of course there were many times where I didn't really understand what the path to becoming an English professor would entail. Um, I didn't understand how rigorous and difficult it could be at certain junctures and there were moments when I thought of doing something else. Uh, I remember the first one being you know, right after college um, and I worked at an academic bookstore and you know I didn't really survive that 
for very long. <laughs> I just wanted to get back into a classroom. And there's, there was something, a kind of emotional connection for me about that. And, and then again, in graduate school, it was, a, it was so competitive to get into a program. Uh, but I had wonderful advisors here at Brown. And uh, I loved graduate school. But we all had this, I called it, I think, the second year slump, you know, where you started thinking, can I be in this place for so many years? And um, with the humanities not getting the funding that they used to, uh, can I continue to pursue this profession? And um, again, I thought of turning away, and, and it was as though what I was doing chose me. And the first time I got into a classroom, I, I knew that that's what made me tick in life. Right? That's what I was really passionate about. And, no matter how chaotic the rest of life was, that was my space. Um, and I think that when you find something that you really love to do, you make it work despite the economy because you, you need it and it, it nourishes you in some way and um, vitalizes you. And there's a kind of emotional connection to that. So again, in the q and I'm happy to talk um, ad nauseum about all the particulars of what it would be to go into academia, which uh, I think is a very worthwhile and wonderful profession. Um, even though I think here, here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, but that was sort of why I ended up where I did. And I, I should say that I, I went to Brown after that year off. Um, I took some time off also before college. I went on to get my doctorate and my master's both at Cornell University. And then, because the gods are crazy, I ended up back in Rhode Island <laughs> <laughs> for my job. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, all of you, uh, for sharing um, your stories uh, um, with us. So, you know, the format today is really to turn um, the, the um, uh, the, the, the table over to you and to, for you to ask questions about what you want to know as your perspective, uh, from your perspective as English majors or as people who might want to concentrate in English about um, the strange past that um, life takes you with and makes English still be a rewarding uh, concentration. Um, I see some familiar faces here uh, and some faces that I should be familiar with because these are people in my class, but I see them in that same vague space of classroom faces, and I can't really remember who you are. Um, I, have to, I have to confess. What, what would you like to, to ask of um, Alice and, and, um, and uh, uh, Jay and Sarah? Most of you English concentrators already, or are you just citing a concentration? Uh, Alice, can you tell us more about the, the Columbia Publishing course? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, so it is a course that runs shortly after graduation. Um, it's six weeks. It's a residential program. You're in there with about 100 other students, um, and you hear you're really in classes from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, that is not an exaggeration. You basically get a meal, a meal break, um, and that's about it. But you hear from people in all aspects of publishing, um, from editorial to publicity to production to design, um, basically all of these areas that you didn't even know existed, and you sort of learn how the entire industry works and how everything sort of comes together. Um, you also do a very intense workshop where you get a little bit more of that sort of hands-on experience, I guess, where you write a lot of copy, um, and you end up with a very nice um, collection of clips for when you do apply to jobs in publishing, if that's what you decide to do. And did you pay for that, Alice? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but they How offer much? very- and Did you remember? I don't remember, but yeah. they do offer a pretty <coughs> generous financial aid, too, so that is um, definitely a possibility. So I have sort of mixed feelings on the course. I thought it was really wonderful and that it introduced me to a very good friend group and a sort of network that you know, I still use now. I still am in contact with those people and they've let me know about jobs that open up. Um, 
But I think, you know, I think that you are all very right, and I think you can probably get a job in publishing without that course. Um, I was just a little bit adrift when I graduated, so I needed that time to sort of be in a classroom environment and to get my footing before I sort of stepped out into the world. Is there another course like that at Radcliffe? Um, it's, that's the Radcliffe that's the, course, that actually, the, and it's um, evolved course. into okay. Columbia course, right. but I think there are courses at NYU and Denver as well. Right. So, yeah. Um, I mean, there are good, is Good. it like ten thousand dollars? I mean, <laughs> ballpark. Um, I would guess. I mean, I think it's definitely less than ten thousand yeah. dollars. I think it's around five thousand. Yeah. Um, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. Um, I think it's a, a worthwhile investment if you need a lot of guidance. I got a lot of resume guidance, a lot of you know interviewing guidance, all sorts of advice of that sort of practical nature. Um, and you know, if you're moving to New York without a friend group in place, like it's a really nice way to go. But, you know, I'm happy to answer more questions about that afterwards or during. Yeah, I should say we're, we're going to go um, after we conclude here to um, the English department for um, a, a, an informal luncheon and more discussion. So um, there, there can be more follow-up questions afterwards. But you, you had something. Yeah, it's for Sarah. You said you took some time off before college. Is this before your undergrad? Yes. And what did you do during your I, um, well, I, I waited tables for seven years to put myself through school <laughs> and get a lot of scholarships, so I was doing that, and I, um, I ended up getting a lot of scholarship money, so then I didn't have to use that money, so um, sadly enough for my parents, I decided that I was going to move to India for a while. <laughs> um, I was also a painter, uh, and I took an apprenticeship in Benares, India, and then I trekked the Himalayas. And then I went to Thailand for a couple months, and you know, I basically got out there in the world, and uh, I was a romantic young person. <laughs> 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 I, say, I say that to my students a lot, that that's an important. I'm advising a student, I really think you go to graduate school right now, and I said, sure, you know, live on a sailboat. I, I lived on a roof for a year, you know, but it, 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 when I was ready, I was ready. So that's, uh, by the time I went to college, I knew what I was going to college for. actually didn't happen until after I got out of my MBA. Um, I didn't quite know what I was going to do. I, I had a lot of different ideas about where I might head. I actually really wanted to be an admission officer. And uh, you know, I worked at the admission office every summer. Uh, that's actually, I met my wife at Brown. She was a classmate. That's how we met. We were both tour guides over there. That's what got me into the web design thing, which got me into the job. Um, I, you know, getting back to thinking about things in, in a, a very practical way of you know, how I'm going to pay off these loans. Uh, there was um, one of the, the uh, members of the administration was sort of a mentor to me, and uh, his office was over in the CIT, if they still call it that, and he had this book on his coffee table for some reason, which had everyone's salary. <laughs> I don't know why he had this book out on the coffee table. He was like, hmm, admission officer, let me open this up. And he's like, wow, they made this. And I thought, oh, you know, that's going to be that's gonna be tough to explain to mom and dad. So uh, for a very practical reason, I sort of, you know, X'd off the admission officer path. Um, so uh, long story short, I, I, I knew that I would probably try to do something in business, and once I got to my junior year, and especially as a senior, um, it, you know, I, I thought there might be an opportunity for me to um, do something like on, on the web design side. Actually, my junior year, there was a session sort of like this, not within the confines of any department, but it was sponsored by Career Services. It was called IT for Liberal Arts Majors. And so there were people from, um, actually a company that IBM ended up buying and a few other firms coming in and saying, well, here are some of the things that you might do. Um, I also had the benefit of graduating at a time when the economy was booming, uh, which is not to be underestimated. But um, I did that uh, for three years at IBM. That's a great company. I learned a lot there, but I didn't really like it. 
and so I knew that I wanted to get an MBA because it would give me options, um, whether that meant going in the corporate side or maybe doing something like in a management position at a not-for-profit or something like that. It would give me um, kind of a core perspective on finance and management that I could take in, in different ways. I, I will say, just to echo something that Sarah said a few minutes ago, it's been my experience, and it sounds like it's, it's been hers as well. When you find something that you like, whatever that is, right, whether it's teaching or uh, for some reason I love working with 401k plans, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that is, you, you know. Um, and it's just a question of how many things you go through before you find that one who you know. Um, you know, IBM is also a Fortune 500 company. It's a great name. I was there, I thought, this is not working. And I was doing a nice job, and it was a good living. I just knew. And then I, I joined another company after business school in a rotational program. I worked in their insurance business for a year. I worked that was interesting and, and, and a good role. I didn't like it. I, again, I knew. And when I had the opportunity to get into the 401k side of their business and become a manager for the first time and, and have the opportunity to lead people, I just knew. And that's, you know, the last eight years I've been doing that work at progressively higher levels of responsibility. So I, I think it probably is the case, whatever one's field is and, and whatever those paths that you're going through to find, you know when you've hit upon something. In the same way that if you were considering other subjects before you chose English as your concentration or whatever your, your current field is, you, you should trust your instincts on that. You should, I think, um, be open to different ideas and challenge yourself not to just go with, okay, my notion is I'll work in this field or I'll study only this field. Try different things, but there is something to be said for the way that something makes you makes you feel, right? So even though I'm finance guy and I should be you know, focused on the numbers and all that and I am at work what ultimately means more to me is okay how does this how is this going to make a client feel right because what my team does is how we service those clients so it's not actually the money management it's everything that's wrapped around that how is something going to be viewed by the people who are working for me um, how does the job make me feel right in, in, in what I'm doing is it something that I can be you know proud of and I think is having some some you know uh, beneficial impact so um, I just think it's very important to be mindful of what are those feelings that you have about what you're studying what your you know part-time job might be what your first role is after college be very attuned to that because I think there is a lesson in that and the more that you can be attuned to it and maybe make some decisions based on that um, I think it can help you. It's like night and day when you're doing something that even if you're good at it feels like a grind and then you're doing something that even if it's challenging to you, you enjoy. In my own experience, just as one person, there's no comparison. And when you hit on something like that, you know, whatever it is, you just, you know. Jay, if you weren't uh, here talking to us, where would you be today? Uh, well, I would probably be uh, in Indiana. Um, the, <laughs> the company that I work for has a big office in Indiana. I've got about a, 100 people in the department that I lead, and uh, most of them are in Indiana, um, answering phone calls, responding to emails. So you're uh, managing a pension plan? Or? Yeah, 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 so the, the, um, we actually, our company manages about uh, $45 billion in retirement plan assets for several thousand clients some universities, some hospitals, some companies. And so there's the investment component of that. There's the relationship management and service component, which is where my team comes in. There are also some kind of technical tax implications to that. So, so you'd be talking to clients about how they feel about their money. I mean, yeah. Essentially, yeah. yeah. And my, my team and, and our coworkers would work with, say, the chief financial officer or the head of HR at a university or a company or a health system talking about, you know, what is the overall level of satisfaction with the retirement plan that Lincoln is offering or, you know, Fidelity does this kind of work or Vanguard or Prudential or a number of other firms, but we enable organizations to offer pension <coughs> or retirement benefit to their employees 
and it's our job to make sure that we're delivering good service on that so that their employees and the decision makers in those organizations are happy with the work that Lincoln is doing. So uh, I live in Massachusetts, but I travel frequently um, to some extent to actually go see some of those clients, but also to be where my people are in our offices in the Midwest. Alice, where would you be? Um, so I work in New York, um, and I would be arranging author tours and talking to media. So that's kind of my um, day to day. On the phone or on the uh, phone, email, email. Um, sometimes actual face to face face <laughs> meetings, um, which is rare these days. But I work in publicity, so that's doing all of the sort of media outreach. Um, what I do is arrange author tours, author events, um, book launch parties. Um, and I also reach out to the editors and reviewers at magazines um, and newspapers and the producers at radio shows and TV shows to talk about the books that are coming up. Um, I usually have you know, three or four books per month that I'm working on. Um, so I will tell them why it's important, um, what this author has done, why their work is relevant, um, and why they should talk to them. Um, and you know, that kind of coverage can take the form of um, interviews, op-eds, um, features, or just reviews. So um, that is probably what I would be doing right now. <laughs> uh, um, Sarah, let me ask you a slightly different question since <laughs> I don't want to subject a fellow traveler to the to con true confession about what she's really doing. <laughs> and since we all know, oh, everybody knows professors don't work, right? right, right. right. Um, but but um, after you made the decision to um, go to graduate school and to do this, um, what was the interval between that and actually finding a job? <laughs> I was incredibly lucky, um, <laughs> or just incredibly dedicated to what I do. So I um, was one of the few people ever at Cornell to get a job her first year on the market, a tenure track position. So admittedly, that is not always the case. Sometimes people go on to get non-tenure track positions, which means they teach like one or two years at a college in a visiting position or do adjuncting or whatnot. Um, so many of my friends are still doing that where they, you know, they try a few times on the market before they get a job. Uh, for me, so I had another romantic moment <laughs> in my fourth year of graduate school. Uh, when I broke up with my partner, I decided that I didn't really like living in Ithaca in the winter, and so I moved out to San Francisco and did some research there for a while, and came back and went on the job market, which is a very long and entailed process in my profession. So that meant that I really finished my dissertation work the year before my final year at Cornell. Um, and defended my dissertation at the start of that year. And most of that year was taken up with applying for jobs. And in our profession, uh, when you're looking for assistant positions or even visiting assistant, etc., cetera, um, the list comes out in one place called the Modern Language Association in September, and mid-September normally. And uh, you never go on on that day because there's so many people looking at the list that you can't even get on the site. Um, and then, you know, we have from that point, um, and you know, I, again, very, I'm pretty put together, so I had asked people for recommendations in August, uh, knowing that I was gonna go on the market that year, um, and it drafted a lot of my job materials by mid-September. Most of the applications in paper form were due in November. If uh, then sometimes they'd ask you for more materials, more writing samples, etc. And then you make it to the interviewing stage. And we have a Mo Modern Language Association convention where all the people in any literary related fields looking for academic positions go to have preliminary interviews. And that's when they're cutting it down to about 10, not even 15, more like 10, 12 people. And, uh, you know, so I put my suit on and did a bunch of these out in Los Angeles. Thank God it was in Los Angeles that year. And uh, then got a lot of immediate callbacks to be um, a number of these institutions flew me out to campus and I had to give a job talk, uh, a lecture with a Q and A and um, met with graduate students and various things and the deans and 
Um, and then, you know, sat biting my nails for two weeks and went into negotiations with the different positions if I came first or second. Uh, but it was a long process, right? It's not like you apply for a job and then get one immediately a month later. And you have to wait for the positions to come out in that annual manner, right? So they are advertised usually in September. And sometimes there are late ads that will come out, especially for the one year or two year positions. Um, but by March, you knew where you were going to be or if you needed to apply for more funding from your graduate school, which a lot of people did. Um, and you taught a couple of there, so yes, yeah, so it it's a very entailed process uh, getting the job. But again, it was a process I actually kind of loved because um, by the time I was interviewing, people were asking me about my work and my writing, my dissertation, and um, and my teaching, and that came pretty naturally to me. So, um, and you get most. Most graduate schools, I should say this, right, if you were to go into an MA or PhD program, um, or PhD programs that include MAs, so some people get a master's and pay for it prior to that. Um, I didn't, I went to uh, Cornell for the PhD and the master's was included in that time. You know, I had a, a stipend, so I lived off of that and had two years just to do coursework and research, and then I was you know, teaching one class a semester uh, seminar, uh, at, officially under the title of a teaching assistant, assistant, but at Cornell we didn't really do teaching assistants, we taught our own freshman writing seminar. And um, so I was paid while I was there, right? And my tuition was covered. It was never a financial sacrifice for me to go to graduate school. And if I had not gotten a job that first year on the market, I would have probably stayed to teach for another year at Cornell while I went on the market again. Um, and so we tend to plan our time around the job market in academia, knowing that those months, a lot of our time will be caught up in, in um, sending materials out and drafting. And the paper application includes a cover letter, writing sample, uh, recommendations, and your CV. And just, just to expand briefly on what Sarah's saying about professional opportunities in, in English, the biggest employer among the graduating class at Brown is always Teach for America. Um, and you have the qualifications. You just kind of put your name in the hopper, and they will send you to um, a high school um, and help you to get uh, a master's degree in, in teaching. It's a wonderful wonderful and, and challenging opportunity um, that you don't even have to think about it, you just kind of do it. <laughs> it's very different from the track that Sarah is describing, which is a, a very demanding um, a hierarchy of, of choices and accomplishments. But I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> You know, for, for me in the business world, I'd, um, I'd eventually like to be the chief executive of the company. <laughs> um, so, that, I mean, that's, that's the way out. But, you know, I mean, may as well aim high. Um, you know, in, in, in the, the nearer term, just, you know, um, trying to get better at what I do, learn about it, and, and you know, uh, try to get progressively more responsible positions um, you know, with that end goal. I think it's probably unlikely, one never knows the future, but it's, it's unlikely that I would say, okay, now I want to get into this line of work. For Is there well. a CEO you really admire? Um, you know, that's an excellent question. I, I think a lot of, I, I must say, I don't read business books. I think a lot of it is just garbage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a lot of CEOs pen their books and I, 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 uh, I don't partake. Um, you know, I, there's not really anyone who comes to mind, to be honest. Um, did you learn anything in business school? I did, I did actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were chatting about that very briefly before things started. So, um, 
I mean, it is still a vocational training, right? It's a professional <coughs> degree program. Um, for me, I, I had actually, I took one econ course at Brown, but my studies were mainly in English and anthropology. I dabbled a little bit in some other fields, but certainly in the humanities and social sciences. And so, um, you know, I, I needed to get uh, a background in economics and, 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 you know, disciplines that are maybe more directly relevant to business. So I actually learned a lot about economics. Um, MIT and, you know, the University of Chicago uh, are, are two programs, Stanford to some extent, where there are business schools that, that sit alongside really excellent economics and sociology programs. And so they tend to bring a little bit more of that uh, into the discipline. Some schools just use case studies. And that's an interesting way and a useful way to learn about different business situations. Um, MIT actually gets fairly into the theory. There is some case study method, but we'd be you know, solving economics problems and doing that. So, um, you know, I, I was always good at math. I mean, I was numerate, but it's not something that I really looked at. And so for me, I actually learned a lot from that that probably, you know, also helped me when the time came to apply for a job after business school that I had gotten that background that I didn't have in my undergrad or even in my job after college where I was you know, doing a program. Alice, can I just ask you something? Mm -hmm. um, you went straight out into the job market, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of where you want to go from here? Um, well, that is a really <laughs> good question. Um, that's a great question, really. Um, I think that where I want to go from here, I want to stay in publishing. I want to stay in publicity. Um, and that was a great, but also sort of difficult question for me because I was like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't given it thought. I think, um, you know, for me, it's been such a progression. I want to get um, bigger authors to work with. I want to work on bigger tours. I want to eventually work on a best-selling book. Um, <laughs> So, which is, you know. And you want to promote well. somebody else's best yes. selling You don't want to write one. <laughs> I, I don't think yeah. I have that right. <laughs> in me. Um, but I think that eventually, you know, to become a director of a publishing house, um, the publicity department of a publishing house would be my ultimate goal, I think. Um, but who knows? <laughs> um, there is a kind of more standard track for once you become an assistant professor, right? So once you hit tenure track, uh, promotions, promotion and tenure is pretty um, organized for us. So there's a certain number of years before you go for tenure and then you make associate professor. And then I think for anyone the ultimate goal would be full professor. And that's sort of sticking around and getting them to still employ you and tenure you. And a lot of um, our promotions are linked around publication, right? So in the more immediate sphere, yeah, I'm trying to get my book published, and um, this summer we'll start or continue to work on my second book. Uh, so you know, teaching is not that's a difference if you decide to go to high school <coughs> or you know to teach high school or to teach college. You know, an enormous amount of what you're doing is um, writing and uh, you know your scholarship. Other questions? Confessions. <laughs> I'm actually about to uh, incorporate, uh, we have a meeting on Monday, it's a big department meeting, and it's kind of um, recap last year and, uh, uh, you know, sort of celebrate the successes of the team and then talk about the goals for the year ahead. And so, um, uh, I'm actually going to incorporate Shakespeare's Sonnet 29 <laughs> into, <laughs> granted it'll be like in a PowerPoint presentation, but, um, and I'm sure people will look at me like I've lost my mind, but this one, this one is one of my favorites. It's the one that starts, when in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone do leave my outcast yeah. state, I in trouble death heaven, my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, etc. And, and it's all about, uh, you know, the, the, the speaker in the poem sort of reflecting on, you know, um, uh, his inadequacy compared to what he sees around him, right? And, you know, talks about desiring this man's art and that man's scope, right? With what I most enjoy, content, at least. All of this stuff, right? And then it turns to, okay, well, when I think back on, in, in the case of this song, as I understand it, you know, my companionship, then I'm reminded of the things of the right? And the, the closing couplet is, for thy sweet 
think it's but I sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. And again, people are probably going to look at me like I've lost my mind bringing this up in a business meeting. But but my intention in using this is it's one of my favorite sonnets. And at our company, we've gone through a very challenging year where we've been successful, but there's been an immense amount of change. We're basically restructuring the way that we do business and changing the systems that underlie how we do the work. And so it's got people stressed out, and people are stressed out and they're tired as a result of this. And so the, the point that I'm trying to make, even though when this was written, Shakespeare was certainly not talking about retirement plan administration, is yes, you can look around and see things that other companies are doing that you know we might be envious of and that you might get hung up on and might bring you down. But in the same way that the speaker in the sonnet is thinking back to his companionship, right, and that brings him some comfort, we need to think about in our company setting, there's a lot that we can be proud of. There's a lot that we've accomplished. So even though things look great out there and we sort of wonder how are we stacking up with these competitors, um, reflect on what we have and what we've done. And again, obviously that's not, you know, what, what the sonnet was written for. It may be a curious thing to bring in, but, um, you know, when I look to literature, it's, um, you know, sort of, I, I think Sarah said it, I won't say it as eloquently, it's a way of understanding our place in the world, right? So my chosen profession is retirement plan administration. I've got about 100 people who are looking to me to set the right tone. And that's my responsibility that's to do that. I, right? I, I have 60. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I think this will be an interesting and, and maybe different way to focus my coworkers' attention on, on what we should be mindful of now at this juncture. Let's we'll see how it goes. Well, we should probably go back to the Department, um, where we have a, uh, a luncheon prepared um, in the lounge on the second floor. Um, I'd just like to share, um, as we close, a little memory of my own about my father, who was an English major at Brown, um, who was graduated uh, a month early in 1942 to join the Army, um, because that's what people were doing, um, because of the Second World War. But my father, um, when he was um, a junior at Brown um, had gotten a job as a page at NBC. And I don't know if you, you all watched that ridiculous show, what's it called, 30 Rock? Um, and there's this, this funny character who's a page, right? I, I can't remember his name as a character. Um, but when, when my father was a page, they actually wore military uniforms, right? Um, you know, with epaulets and insignia and everything. And, uh, um, what uh, he was basically doing was giving a tour of Rockefeller Center to people, and what people were looking at was the radio studios. Um, when he came back from the Second World War, he, he got his first job at NBC, um, which was kind of guaranteed because he'd been employed by them as a page when he was a junior in college. And he, he, his first job was being a radio script editor for NBC, but he ended up being in the generation of people who um, brought us television as we now no longer know it. He, he brought us, his generation brought us network television. And, and now my, my sister and her husband are working in um, the new media of uh, electronic um, creative arts, um, which go alongside of and, and cooperate with what Alice is doing. There is a tremendous demand out there for words um, and for what Jay was describing as the way that we relate to our, our, our other human beings and to our own past through words. And I think that's really what we do best as English majors. I mean, um, being able to remember something as Jay um, just demonstrated and to show that it is meaningful shows that the meaning is what you do with the words. It's not the words themselves, it's what you do with the words. Uh, I, um, you know, my, my, my brother-in-law, who's the um, CEO of a major media company, it's the, it, actually, it's the company that brought, brings us Mad Men. Um, um, they're looking for content. They're looking for you, right? Um, there are only so many um, uh, football games and, and, and rerun movies 
uh, that people can tolerate. They're looking, people are looking for new material in every aspect of our lives, whether it's the media or whether it's um, teaching or whether it's just the ways in which we communicate with one another on a daily basis to keep our lives um, moving forward and, and being happy. Um, so it's, I think that English is a relation to the word that is fundamentally important. And I thank everybody here for talking and for speaking and asking um, questions. Um, it's a good demonstration of what we do well. So thank you for coming, all of you. <laughs> and we'll, we'll reconvene at the English department um, for sandwiches and refreshments.